Hello there, Richard. Hey, Jude. How are you? Very good, thanks. Thanks so much for taking the time to have a, have a Zoom call today. Um, That's all right. I'm really, really excited to talk to you about essentially uh, the, the game designer's approach to looking at the, 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 the real depth within designing consumer experience and indeed understanding mm. people more than just you know, a post-it note on a wall. So I was wondering, could we get into also a little bit about your background and how you ended up moving from just designing, you know, boxes to actually getting into play and toy design? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Firstly, do you like my virtual background? I thought I chose it very carefully. There's a whole bunch of interesting stuff that I'm hiding there. <laughs> but, you know, I, I obviously usually work for the studio, so it's uh, I've left all my goodies back at base. But, yeah, no, it's uh, it's, I think, a lot of people who get, into toys and particularly get into games it's not something you study you know it's not something most people think i'm going to be a game designer there are some people in the world who have kind of ended up that way but very few so um yeah i sort of i think you know when i was at school i didn't really know what i wanted to do um and probably looking back i was more interested in the subjects where you wanted to ask questions not necessarily know the answer. I didn't think about that at the time, but I wasn't very good at taking information, remembering it, and then outputting it onto an exam paper. But when I, I so when I left, I, 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 I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I kind of knew I, something art, something technical. I like making stuff. Um, so I actually went to graphic designer initially because that was the, you know, it's the only thing I really knew as a design subject. I knew fashion design and graphic design pretty much it um and um so i went to see a lecturer and i <laughs> i took you know some woodwork stuff some pictures of some fantastic lego creations i'd made some sci-fi drawings you know literally hardly nothing to do with graphic design he said have you ever considered product design i went no what's that he says see this phone on my desk yeah someone designed that <laughs> ah. and of course you know it, it, it's like a lot of people when you talk to them about product design, industrial design, whatever. Most people don't even think about it. They understand engineering. They understand kind of design. And, and it's obviously, as we you know, it's two completely separate things, although they obviously are, we're all mashed together. So and that's kind of how the journey started, really. And then when I started doing product design, all the sort of, for me, it all started to click into place that actually there is no brief, there is no product. It's a blank sheet of paper. We've just got to go and find out what the best solution to this problem is. Uh, and I was very lucky, we had a really good lecturer um, uh, who all our products were industry set. So we were literally from the first year, we were pitching to sort of CEOs of companies and, and that is such a great training ground. We're on for critique, because mm. I think the biggest, you know, people say, oh, you know, but what's, you know, what's the professional designer over? Everyone could have a good ideas. Of course we are. We're human beings. We're, we're innate creative creatures. Um, but for me, and I think talking to other designers over the years and, and for all disciplines, I think that crit that professional critique is the difference, actually. It's learning to take critique from your peers and kind of going away a little bit with your head in, you know, okay, go and sort that out, but also being able to self-critique yourself. So even though you've spent days and days on something, you come back and look at it and go, that's, that's not great. I need to start again. Or, you know, and when I see, obviously I see a lot of inventors now, and that's the biggest issue I have with people, that they don't critique themselves um, or they're not willing to take critique. And of course, nothing will progress. If you cannot do that fundamental thing as a designer, because we're not artists, you know, this is, the, we're not kind of, Art is art, you know, but we, we are commercial designers. We are being paid money to design something to essentially make a company some money, generally speaking, you know, but hopefully more than that to hopefully make a, the right product. But, you know, you have to sort of figure all that out. And anyway, that's something like, you know, so we learned all of that when I was studying. I, it was a really good course and, and because we had all of that critique. And I came out feeling pretty confident, actually, that I kind of knew that I had... I felt, and all you all do is don't really leave university. It's like, yeah, I've got all the tools. I'm going to be the best designer in the world. Um, of course, in the re <laughs> but uh, so yeah, it was it was good. And I, but but really, uh, um, I hadn't uh, looking back. This kind of where I am now in this kind of playfulness, it didn't really sort of start. Well, it may have started then. I perhaps didn't realise it. 
so but yeah i'm kind of interested what you mentioned about sort of uh that that journey to become better at self critique um mm. it, it reminds me of i i uh i hope you won't mind mentioning his name but a, a tutor called dagfin at uh my university and i remember him saying something which he, he's left now so it's not not a sackable offense but he just said to me what what grade do you want and i said come again and he said yeah, yeah. well what what grade do you think it's worth and he said, well, I, I can look at this and you might have made all sorts of assumptions and pulled the wool over my eyes. I can't be an expert in everything. I've got mm -hmm. 30 students to look at. So you tell me, is this, is this like the best possible thing you could have done with the time and resources you had available? Or do you feel it's severely lacking? And I was sort of like completely floored by that, mm. you know, candor mm. as well. And, and just the, mm. the, the shifting of responsibility. And I said, well, gosh, I said, maybe it's a B. And he said, well, you know, you, I know you well enough that it, that probably means it's like a B plus or an A minus. So, all right, then let's get into a discussion about why you think it fell short. What would you have changed? And, and instead of it being this grading session, it became this mentoring session of, mm -hmm. of what is it that were my weaknesses? Were they just things that I should sign off to in experience? Or mm. could I have found solutions to and done things differently? Or indeed, mm. availed of his experience and network to help mm. me, which he was very willing to give uh, and assist with. So I, I always remember that being a very, you know, sort of burnt into my brain, that moment. And I, mm. I, I wonder, sort of taking yourself back to that journey, when, when were moments where you felt, you know, there was a big shift in your confidence that you could self-critique yourself and it wasn't an omission of, of, of crippling weakness and that you're an imposter and should never have been there in the first place. Mm. Well, I suppose it's interesting because at school, it doesn't often happen. I did, I suppose the subject, I used to do some drama kind of on the side. I never studied it, but I used to kind of like doing it in plays. And of course, there's a lot, probably that was the subject you get most critique at in a, in a mm -hmm. personal way, because it's not like you got the answer wrong. There was no answer. It's like... Mm. you perhaps didn't portray that character in quite the right way. It's like, that's a very subjective thing. And, and of course, in any form, it, there are parts of design that obviously are subjective. It, you know, the cost might be the same, the manufacturing solution might be the same. You know, it really comes down to personal preference. And that's always a kind of, you know, it's like, oh, I just don't get it. What does that mean, you know? Like, you have to, but that's someone's reality, you know, you just have to kind of deal with that. Maybe learn to ask, interrogate the questions and try and find out exactly from them what they didn't like. Mm. But I think probably, you know, I, I do remember my first critique um, at design school, where you have, you know, the literally it was the, you know, the A2 plastic wallet, you know, on the wall, you know, all the round standing back in trepidation and then just, you know, the other sort of 30 students just rip it into it. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, you just got to be a, you know, yeah, absolutely. I, I see your point. Yeah, maybe I do. I, and yeah, the first time it's hard. It is hard. But you, but you learn by that. You know? and, and I think that's, again, I think if you haven't been through that or had the opportunity to, to have a, a creative critique, it's difficult for some people when someone then comes along and says, I don't really like your idea very much. And, and you know, we'll get on to probably toys and inventing and stuff, but that happens 98% <laughs> of the time, mm. you know. Uh, so you've, it's, you know, whether you're doing a film script or whether you're doing a, you know, a book or whether you're doing a design or whatever it be, you, you're going to get that constant no, 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 no. And you've got to sort of kind of take from the, all those experiences. Sometimes you won't get much out of them, but a lot of the time you will if you ask and you can piece the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so, yeah, I suppose it was then, it was really, you know, maybe it was at school and I hadn't really kind of realised it. I'd say the drama side, most subjects are, you just get your mark back, you get a mark on it. There's no real discussion over why you got the mark. <laughs> it's just you got the mark. Um, and you move on, you know. So... Yeah, it wasn't still and still sort of further education that I, I you probably have those adult discussions about some you know why it is the way it is, mm. but I think that, that 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 grounding has certainly helped me to um, I think interact with other 
other professions. You know, designers are not, you know, to be a successful designer, or, you know, if you're a product designer, industrial designer, you've got to work with marketing and engineering and sales and everybody who's connected with your product. And you've got to be able to listen to their gripes because they'll all have gripes, you know. And um, you, you essentially, you know, a lot of part of my career has been a middleman, you know, between what what the engineers really and the factory don't want to do and what marketing really do want to do. And you're trying to find this kind of middle ground, which get so you have a product, you have a you know a solution between what the, the dreamers, you know, the ultimate. Oh, I want it to kind of this, 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 and cost nine ninety nine. And, <laughs> and the factory saying, "Well, it's fine, but we, you've got to use all the same tools we've been using for the last ten years." Hmm. Okay, you know. Um, so yeah, and actually, my first you know uh, my first professional experience of that was actually a mop. You know, we talk about boxes, but my first real, my first proper job, I worked in the consultancy for a little bit. Um, uh, but when I, I, then I got a job at Curva. In fact, I'll show you a picture. Hold on. I've got it. I was digging this out. So this is the, the Curva catalogue from 1990. Wow. And um, I think if we look, flip to the inside page, the fresh-faced person on the drawing board. No way. <laughs> <laughs> That was ah. such a stage. That you can, that, that, any designer will know that is such a staged photograph. I think that was the last time I wore a tie as well, apart from the <laughs> wedding. I think professionally that was the last time I wore a tie in 1990. Um, so, yeah, my first job was um, as a mop, and they designed this mop. Actually, the marketing guy had kind of... Addis made the best-selling mop in the country, and uh, they made a mop, and they wanted to sort of copy it. And so he sort of went sort of round the normal processes and sort of somehow i don't really know how he got it happened but they made tools of this mop which was basically copying addis no surprise they got sued so my first job from the ceo was <laughs> please redesign this mop so it doesn't infringe the patents oh, okay so I, I i i wander down with my you know designer sketchbook down to the uh, injection molding plant being, and then was sort of rapidly told all the things I cannot do because the waterway is running through the tool and the ejector pins. And then I was just like, oh, okay. So we literally sat there and it was he was a great guy, actually. And I learned a lot about injection molding very, very fast. Um, and we sort of managed to design with mainly metal on <laughs> and a few inserts and stuff to kind of get this thing to not infringe the patent. So it was a kind of, yeah, it was an interesting process, but I, I kind of enjoy those challenges, actually all through my career, I kind of enjoy those kind of pressure moments. I think it brings out the best of me. I think a lot of designers, actually, when you come, when you get to the, you know, mm. when you scratch the surface, it's like, it's good having, I, I kind of like designing to limitations, actually. Um, mm. it, it, I find you get kind of good stuff, but yeah. Um, where were we? I've lost track of where we was designing. I was, I was just in the, I was in the injection moulding machine room. I can remember it quite clearly. Yeah, but I think I think you make an interesting point actually about sort of inflicting a little bit of pressure on oneself to to to, to understand truly what you're made of, and I don't mean that as in a sort mm. of a, a macho sounding thing, but just almost what what things you realise you are good at under pressure, what things you 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 break under, and what things you realise quick. I got to go find someone who can bolster mm. the the situation for the better. Um, I, I, I do feel it's not to make this discussion all about students, because I think the next question I hope actually feels relevant to someone at any stage in their career. But but often I think we look to a, a job as, as almost like a sort of perfect spouse, as if they've got mm. to be everything and, and encapsulate everything and somehow anticipate all our needs. And I think it, it seems healthier to maybe say that's the wrong fit. There's maybe a core source of income which is stable and reliable, but you have other things that run parallel, um, mm. which you pick up, put down in different sequence. And so I wonder, I guess what I'm describing is really the folio career approach, but but how have you sort of seen the the pros and cons of that over over the years? Of of having diversity, should we say, in in, yeah. in, in breadth. Yeah, and, and I think that if, even if I look at the companies I've worked for, the ones that have done well are the ones that have diversity. You know, diversity in life is a good thing. You know, it, it, from a, I think, a life, um, an, an enjoyment of life, 
point of view, that you're not just doing one kind of thing, but also just from a commercial reality, just getting through life. It's good to have fingers in different pies. Um, and I think as designers also, we should be, the people that go into design are generally more open-minded to trying new things, or they should be, hopefully. Um, they're not sort of necessarily very risk-averse. Um, so they just need to apply some of that innate skill they have into their own life. You know, mm. this one, design your life. And I haven't, I've never been someone who's had like a plan in it. So I've never had a five-year plan because I, I, I just, I just wouldn't keep to it. I would always be wanting to do something different. Um, and you never know what's like, you know, this life's going to throw you away either. So, but I think, I think a portfolio approach is, is good. And you know, that said, some people might look at me and think, well, then you've said that, you know, you've actually done pretty much the same job for most of your life. And, and that's kind of true, you know, although I've done lots of different things within it, you know, but yeah, the, the, the fundamentals of what I do um, have kind of stayed with me. And I'm very lucky in that respect. I do think I'm still lucky to be working in the sort of profession that I train to do. Um, but I think... Um, I think always keeping a very open mind to kind of what's going on in the world. You know, I said as, as you know, we're, we're kind of an insight driven business. So just don't do that professionally. Just think about, well, you know, do that, look at those insights on a personal level as well. Where could these take me? Not just this is, this, I can see this, how the impact on the future of mobile phones. It's like, well, that's kind of interesting. What sort of impact might that have on me? actually, mm. you know, is my job still could be ready. Again, it's that kind of that comes back to that self-critique of like looking at the looking at what you have and thinking, is this is this going to be the, the same thing? Is it right? Do I need to adapt? Do I need to, you know, don't just assume what you have is going to be around, you know, in another 12 months time. You know, look at where we are now. <laughs> it's like for a lot of people, this has turned the world upside down. You know, they can't mm. plan for this situation. So you have to creatively find solutions to it. Um, and, yeah, I think I'm, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm sort of lucky enough, I suppose, that I'm able to do that. But I think, I think everybody can. They just need to give themselves permission to do it, really, mm. you know. I guess, I guess I'm interested to know, maybe we can use games as a sort of reference here, but... I would imagine that as much as game designers, I guess a little bit like filmmakers, occasionally you make something which is just staggeringly mm. genre redefining. But a lot mm. of the time you are actually in close conversation with the end user. And so mm. you could say that, you know, cinema quite often mirrors social life, social commentary to quite a close degree. Um, uh, this is not scripted, but I'm kind of curious to know, do you, do you feel games, when you look back at them, you go, actually, they do mirror societies? You know, oh, sort definitely, of... yeah, definitely. Well, if you look at back at Monopoly... Yeah, it was, was just about to it say. Was, it, 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 it was designed in the Great right? Depression. It was designed in <laughs> the Great Depression. No one could have any money, no one could afford any houses, so Monopoly was uh, an escapism, you know, it was absolutely escapism. And, and a lot of good games are really mm. that's a very overt theme of course you know it really was and, and a lot of games today aren't as overt as that but like there's a, there's a you know if you look at the current trends with games there's a lot of collaborative games going on whereas there you know you win together or lose together and i think that reflects a lot of people's feeling about society that you know we're going to sort of solve some of the big issues together we're not there isn't going to be a winner and a loser we actually all need to kind of win Mm. Get, you know, compete against the game so I think some of it's quite a, a bit subliminal you know I don't want to sort of necessarily dig deep too much and try and find meaning in it but I think obviously as game design people are you know essentially games are designed by people and people are reflecting their their hopes wishes dreams whatever into a game um so but a game really is a a story you know that's the biggest thing um and that's what's, you know, as, as I've sort of migrated through sort of cons regular consumer products, got into play, mm. which um, really, for me, was all about experience. You know, we were, we were doing experience design before it was even a, a term, you know. <laughs> to toys and games, they're all about experience. They're innately about experience. And user interface, you know, a game board, or especially games, they were completely about user interface. You know, how it looks, can people navigate the game? 
all the cards? Can they read the cards? Do they make sense? Do these symbols make sense? And it's all user interface. But we didn't really think about it when, we were, when I started on games. It wasn't a term. Um, but uh, I think it, it, experiences are are so important in, in products. And I think you're seeing that sort of migrate through probably from the games industry and the play. You know, more people are playing games than they ever have done. Yeah, you know, I'm talking digital games as well, if you're Angry Birds and, you know, mm. Bejeweled and all those kind of things. And reaching a much more wider demographic than they ever used to. And, and all this playing has an effect on people. You know, all this gameplay has an effect on people. Um, so I think that has changed people's... Uh, yeah, I think it's changed people, some people's outlook on on in things they do, and you know, and the strength of games. You know, right now is is so strong. You know, people are really coming together, sort of virtually mm. playing games and playing games as families in lockdown, and you know, rediscovering some of those simple things. So, I yeah. mean, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the sort of like the coming together of family, and that. Uh, I think it's 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 interesting, certainly without getting too much into Lego specific stuff, but I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying, you know, a big trend had been moving away from opening a box of Lego, being told to, you know, sit quietly, be seen, be not uh, mm. and not heard because mummy and daddy have got to mm. go do something important. Um, and I think the brand has obviously shifted to much more, you know, socially dynamic things with not just sort of uh, kids, but also older people, younger people, all these other sort of facets being brought in. And so it feels like really understanding the user experience. I would imagine the bar has been raised in your profession because you're not just Definitely. going after one seven-year-old boy in yeah, white yeah, yeah. middle-class suburban America anymore. You're mm, really mm. having the whole yeah. spectrum. Yeah, and, and, and the hardest thing, you know, I did toys for kind of eight, nine years, and then I switched to games. And it really was like doing a completely different thing, completely. You know, I had to learn so much new skills. Yeah, sure, there's the the physical design part of it, but the most important thing in a game isn't in the game. You don't make it, it's the experience. Mm -hmm. It sounds crash, but but that's what it is. And um, it's what, essentially, you've got four human supercomputers. (laughs) You know, it's a four-play game trying to rip your thing apart and trying to figure out how they're going to win and how they can, you know. So you, in a way, you it's trying to, it's designing in the white space. An experience actually is the thing you don't try and design. It's the, some people think you've got to control everything like a computer game, you know, and if you're sort of designing a game on rails, which a lot of computer games are, the experience in my mind is a little bit, it, it, it's a bit 2D if you like, because, <laughs> They're guiding you through an experience. Whereas if you're playing something analog, it could really go, yes, there is a pathway, of course, but there's lots of branching and it's very hard to control. And the experience is really what people obviously bringing to it is the mm. most important thing. You you set out the groundworks, the foundations for how that experience hopefully will build. But, you know, I've played games, the same game with some people and it's been in a, 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 you know, especially party games, fantastic experience. Other times it's been the dullest thing I've ever done. It's the same product, nothing's changed. It's what people are bringing to it. Um, and that's a very hard thing to design for, um, really. But I think there's other things, and I was thinking about this, I know, you know, in terms of product experiences, and you know, you, you did some work at Dyson. And I would argue that actually the most one of the most important things about Dyson is not something that you ever make. It's the dirt. Mm. It's the dirt that you see in the clear bowl. Oh, yes. <laughs> because yeah. if you couldn't see it, you know, that's half the fun of it. It's like, look at all this dirt. Look at how dirty my head. Oh, this is great. That gives you a sense of, you know, it's like when you run a vax and you kind of clean your carpet, you empty the dirty water away. Look how dirty that. Oh, I really, you know, if it wasn't anything, if you didn't see it, it would be no satisfaction in it. So I, I think it's trying to find those experiences that people have in all manner of products. Um, but it's what people bring to it. And it, sometimes, it, again, it's not what you actually design. And for a designer, that's kind of hard. Because you think, well, I've got, to just, I've got to kind of tick all the boxes and, you know, everything I design is going to create that experience. And it's kind of learning to step back and go, have I created enough? Because actually, if you create mm. too much, you're boxing people in. You, they don't have that kind of self-discovery. Um, yeah. You know, and Lego obviously is the perfect product for that, of course, you know, because you 
you create the thing and then of course you can just completely dismantle the DNA of it and start again. So, um, and not all products can be done like that, of course, some products, mm. you know, but it's trying to find um, where those opportunities are, you know, um, and I think as more products become experiential, um, it's something that a lot of designers will come into contact with, mm. you know, outside of the toy game kind of set, set up. But yeah, particularly the experience of games is is uh, is probably for me. I I couldn't think necessarily of something that was more ex- from an experience design point of view than designing games. Mm. I guess one thing that I thought might be interesting to pick your brains on as well about that experience is is when you look at sort of games like Monopoly, they're often memorable because of the emotions that they elicit mm. out of everyone. And so quite often people's memory of Monopoly isn't about did you buy Old Kent Road or whatever it was. It's like, God, I can't believe that day when my gran, who's usually so nice and so generous, absolutely like crucified dad, you know, at Christmas, you know, mm. it's, 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 it elicits something unexpected and creates a very strong emotion. And I, I think what's kind of interesting and dare I say it, you know, I'm not a game or anything, but I, I can't help but notice the, the digital games world are creating very, very strong emotions of what teams are doing, what, uh, leagues, it, it's becoming very much like football, um, mm. a, a, and it's got this incredible ability to be very local with you and your friends, all the way through to a global arena um, of people who you've never met supporting you yeah, and yeah, yeah. quite quite literally yeah, yeah. throwing money at you. And yeah. part of me feels like, where have you sort of seen parity, but also a meaningful you know, differentiation with, with your work? I think, I think it's interesting because um, I've done quite a lot of work over the years with working with the brands I've worked on with the digital counterpart, you know, whether it's EA Games or whatever. And we've sat in a room together and, you know, essentially we're trying to do the same thing. Our, our, our skill set is slightly different in that, you know, they're, obviously their skill set is the pixel and mine's the, you know, the um, often the tube of plastic. But it's... Actually, what we're trying to do is exactly the same. And, you know, I've worked on a lot of stuff which is app-related, so I can see that, and I think there's a place for everything, and there's a lot of... um, uh, Ultimately, you're trying to create a fun experience. But I think there is something about the, 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 the physical, tangible effect of sitting face-to-face with someone, often, you know, around a table or something, which we've been doing for over 6,000 years, if you go back to some of the earliest games recorded, I'm sure they go back way longer than that, but the, the games that have been found, you know, uh, carved into, you know, uh, walls and, and stuff like that. But um, there is something tangible about that kind of face-to-face experience and that human connection. In the same way as eating the meal together, you know, you can, it's, it's different when you just have a burger and munch that, but you want to sit down and have, you know, it's the same kind of thing. So, the game is a facilitator for other stuff. Mm. And I think, um, and of course, I'm not saying computer games aren't like that as well, because, you know, they, they, a lot of it is all the chat that goes on outside of the game, the gamer talk, you know. So in a way, it, they both do the same thing. A game is a, con, it, it's a product, it's a conduit for other mm. th- discussions. Hopefully you'll have fun playing the game, of course. But the, the enjoyment is it, 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 not, if it's just the game doing all the heavy lifting there, it's probably going to fail. You know, it's mm. people coming together and airing other grievances <laughs> and bringing <laughs> other stuff to the party, just having a laugh. You know, that's what it's all about, you know. So, um, but I again, guess it's, it's trying... No, sorry, sorry, sorry. no I just no, said just... it comes back to that of desire, under, not trying to think you've got to tick all these boxes yourself you know what what the, what what in the products going to do that what in the products can do that let people bring their creativeness to the mm. product that that is the key and i guess i guess that's something that i i, I really am all sort of always quite you know sort of surprised that it isn't underscored enough and i wonder whether it's maybe a bit of a tension with marketing that mm. quite often you know when you when you look at say like the nintendo wii um you can get into the detail of whether it's got an accelerometer and all this sort of stuff in, but 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 most engineers would actually say it really wasn't 
technologically sophisticated. It was very, very, you know, cheap and easy by mm, mm, industry standards mm. compared to what was out there. And yet everyone knows it's the experience that's memorable about playing on the Wii. And so mm. I, I think Nintendo really, you know, hearing a, an interview with one of the, the lead designers, he was saying he actually goes out of his way to look for old but very, very robust technology that oh, as a result sick. is super cheap and yeah. it's de-risked and he mm. can get it because he's off, you know, obviously they're a big company, they can buy it at volume, but it means that almost they create something where the brand is the thing that is the markup, that mm. there is no money to be made by undercutting them on a race to the bottom mm. because they already yeah. bought the cheapest technology out there. Mm. So I thought that was quite a quite a tactical move. And I guess if it's, a, if it's not too much of a pivot, what other slightly, should we say, counterintuitive tactics do you see being deployed in the market now in a creative way? Yeah, I've always, you know, you have to, from, from Nintendo's point of view, they are a playing card company. You know, they started yeah. out as a, you know, so their DNA actually as a company is not high tech, it's actually low tech. And, you know, I've always said as a toy designer, you know, the most, you can still have a lot of fun with a flashing LED. You know, it depends what you do with it. You know, if you put a flashing LED in the end of a lightsaber, oh, it's like that. So you put a flashing LED, you know, in an eye, then it's like, oh, it's kind of, he's, you know, he's, he's got a, he's got a mecha, mechanized robot eye. So again, it, it, it's bringing, it's letting, again, from kids' point of view, bring their creativeness to it. And I think, I think we've got into a, you know, particularly with mobile phone design, into a pretty lazy, in my opinion, way of design. You know, these products are super high end. Really, really powerful. Most people will use 10% of the features of these devices. Um, and actually, a lot of time, they're too complicated for the average user. There's too much going on. Mm. And and I'm not saying go back to the sort of big button, you know. <laughs> the screen. Actually, and I think, you know, going forward as a society, you know, we have to learn to reuse stuff a bit more. You know, and I think we're seeing this in products where, they, you know, there's an EU re legislation coming in about repairability, mm. you know, making things... Well, that has implications because it's not just like, oh, this bit of plastic's broken off or this screw's broken off. It, most things are techno you know, technological. So that means that there could be a trend for products to last much longer. So there won't... I think we are perhaps going to get away from this cycle of... And it really has, if you think about it, been driven by phones, which is bounced onto all manner of items. Yeah, we used to be happy to keep our TV. Well, my parents had a TV for 12 years, I think. You know, was, you know, now it's like, you know, oh, two years, well, it's all already out of date. You know, it's 16K, 32K, 40, you know. And it's crazy, you know. And most of the stuff does, doesn't matter. So I think that will be something that will filter through and reusing technology, you reusing, making their products last longer, making the things inside them have to be upgradable in a different way. Um, I can certainly see that as a challenge. Um, and in today, you know, I've got toys in my loft that, you know, my kids had when they were young, which are kind of like, you know, getting off 20 years old. And I've got them out. And I, I know if I gave them a the child today, they'd be very, very happy with them. So toys have had always had this ability to be kind of stored away and brought out again. And, and wow, mm. it's great. It's, you know, because it's that... It's that memory. There's not many other consumer products which you'd want to bring out 20 years later and give to a relative and go, look what I've given you. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> you know, whereas toys, you know, if they're in good condition and they're, you know, durable, yeah. and it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, and, and actually one of the things that attracted me to games was from an, not overtly, but I did like it, that generally speaking, they're quite an environmental product that, you know, one, they're generally made of quite environmentally friendly materials. And even if they've got plastic in, they tend to be kept for years and years and years. Mm. And people don't... I'd like... I, I would challenge people to go down their local um, recycling centre and find any games complete in a recycling bin. People never throw games away. Mm. And there's very, very rarely, they'll give them to charity shops, they'll give them to relatives, they'll probably store them in the loft. And the reason for that is actually you're throwing away your memories. People don't think about that, but essentially you are. Mm. You, you know, okay, if it's been a terrible game and you haven't enjoyed it, and it may be. But the, the vast majority of times, 
people want to keep these things because essentially they're you know it's like getting a monopoly game out that you've had for 50 years it's all screwed up and the cards are ripped and but that's great that's all the memories we had when we played these and you can remember who ripped the card and who smashed the board and you know when yeah. when spike at the spike jumps up on the table and it you know your dad's hotels um so and i think that's the difference with toys as well when parents throw away kids toys um, you know, kids get very upset because the parent actually has no emotional connection with that toy. It's just it's a space. It just takes up space. Whereas from a kid, it's like, what are you doing? It's just it's like it's you know, my legacy. Are, <laughs> it's, it's my legacy. You know, it's so, um, but but obviously, it's products where you have a shared emotional connection with, obviously, games being one of them, uh, people treasure a lot more. Um, so I think yeah, all those trends. For, for certain are gonna are gonna impact if you're in the you know the business the business of any kind of d- design engineering it's definitely gonna in the next well even now but it, particularly in 10 years it's gonna have a huge impact on the kind of products we design in a way going back a little bit to you know more quality perhaps you know less consumerism but the products we buy are are better designed you know mm. I think it's a good thing. You know, we don't. None of us want landfill of of just stuff that gets used once and thrown away. That's 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 not a sustainable approach. Mm. Do, do do you imagine that? Uh, it, I never thought about this, but I, I remember at Dyson there was a a bit of legislation around um, energy efficiency. So you can mm. you could no longer on vacuum cleaners just say, "Oh, look, this thing's amazingly powerful," but you go, mm. "Yeah." but it's drawing like two kilowatts and it's 60% efficient. Mm. And so there was new mm. directives to say, you know, you, you have to perform at a certain level of minimum efficiency mm. from pulling power out of the wall. It, it, it sounds crazy, but you almost wonder whether there was a sort of a, a, a way that we could to, could rank toys to say, relative to the money that you spent, relative to the re- Earth's resources that it took to make mm. it, how much hour and how, how many hours of pleasure and fun do you actually get out of this? And it would be, you know, I mean, I realize we're getting into an over quantified world, so I'm not sort of looking for uh, us to be chipped and and monitored in how no. we play things. But you know, it's it, it's hard to argue with a game like I don't know Uno, which is like mm. paper in a box. Mm. Like mm. man, those are dog eared in our, in my grandparents' house. Those have been played yeah. and played and played till they're full to games. pieces. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, there was a big directive some years ago because we went through this spate of um, having big boxes with hardly anything in them. Mm. So there was the there was the directive from the I think it was EU probably EU but sort of went globally where you you could only have so much air in a box, um, which I thought was a good thing, you know, because from again that because from a marketing point of view, you're kind of selling this dream. And, and in some countries like Southern America, Spain, for example, they love big boxes. Other countries like small boxes. So there was always this kind of push and pull actually in the local markets of what the consumer kind of liked. But some markets did like the big box, but you open them up and they're just full of air. And of course, that's crazy because you're shipping, you know, your sh- shipping is not, you know, especially if it's from China, it's, it's not an inexpensive part of the product. Um, so that was a good thing. And I think just I, a lot of this, I think, just will naturally come through better quality materials. Mm. Um, it doesn't have to, I'm not saying everything has to be made of wood or, you know, it just, but it's just designing it so it does the job. You know, it stands up and, and can be replayed for the amount of times you say it's going to be replayed. It doesn't just fall mm. apart. Um, so I think if I, if I started in the business, there was some pretty horrendous product on the market. And I won't say what, but there was a lot of horrendous products on the market. And, and, and I was lucky, you know, I worked for Hasbro, so they, they were a really good company, actually. We had very sort of decent quality standards. But, yeah, some of the products we used to find for the competition were shocking. But but I guess it's it's almost it's almost interesting to consider, I mean, maybe the different industry of, of, of say, like cooking and how mm. quite often the, the industry around sort of cooking, at least for the home market, is your... You're of course selling ingredients, and then quite often mm. there's a big market in publishing of selling how to put those ingredients together, mm. and and I sort of wonder is there parity with with play in that, you know, you're you're buying things that you can't just you can't just easily turn up a wooden piece and paint it, you know, with half a gram of yellow paint. 
Um, of course, there's economies of scale, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that we just play with acorns and blades of grass, you know. Um, although I do do that a lot with my my toddler, um, but I sort of wonder whether you're starting to see a shift in how to sort of utilize the resources that are in the home. I mean, I appreciate I should confess that I'm obviously biased because I run junk modeling videos and stuff like this, but I, I do wonder, to be brutally honest, is it making economic sense to big toy companies to go down that avenue? Or is it just virtue signaling? Yeah. Um, I think, I think where possible, um, obviously from a company's point of view they don't want to make waste for mm. themselves so they want to sell the, the best experience at the right price and you're, it's like seeing like you know it's that move that we've seen in supermarkets with the hand well hand gels they say but anything with a pump you know the pump we all know as designers hey that pump with the spring that, that's not cheap goes in the bed yeah that's that's a pretty decent but, you know, the actual water-based gel stuff in the bottle is probably like 5% of the cost. Yeah. It's probably, you know, that, that springy bit is probably as much as the gel. So it drives me crazy. Going back to going, but again, it's the, it's the mindset of changing the consumer to go, okay, well, rather than just, I will always buy one with the pump because I don't know if I've got one at home, going before they go shopping, oh, actually, I'm going to buy one with the pump because this one's still fine. It, it's a mindset change. Mm. And but I think I think toys that have done the best, and again, you know, I have to say Lego in this as well. But I think like Brio and Connect, anything that's modular, you're sort of reusing what you have. You're dragging some something old which you haven't used before and reusing it with this new thing, and suddenly it becomes you know one and one is equals three, and that's fantastic. Um, games are slightly different because you kind of want to. There's nothing worse than opening a box of games and finding the key component is gone, <laughs> has gone missing for some other use, and so you can't play it, and then it kind of becomes redundant. So I think it's like you know, Uno. If there was that, you know, if, if if there was a couple of key cards missing, it would be a bit annoying. So I think I think you have to be kind of sensible, but um, the consumer has changed. I'm not saying all companies have necessarily changed with them. You know, mm. consumers are more savvy than we give them credit for. A lot of companies give them credit for in the decisions that they'll make, and kids especially. You know, kids are often mm. at the forefront of this stuff. They're very, you know, aware of the environment and the decisions they make and the purchasing power they have. Um, you know, I've had some very interesting. I think we we'll talk about jumping around a little bit, but one of the things I'm very fortunate to do or have done and still do, but. You know, when you, when a kid has a conversation with an adult who's not a family member, that's kind of unusual. You know, don't talk to strangers, you know, and stuff. So, which I understand. But in my line of work, obviously, we test and try out concepts with kids. And and after, you know, you've been with them sort of 15 minutes and they sort of start to open up about, you know, in quite an adult way, you know, a conversation that you wouldn't normally have with a child. Um, or they probably wouldn't have with their parents. Um about their thoughts and why should this be this way and why should this be this? You know, I often come away from kid testing going, wow, you know, I've just spent two weeks on this and these guys have cracked it in like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so I think that's, uh, you know, I love talking to kids actually and you get the opportunity to kind of see really what their thinking is. And I think ultimately empowering them to, I, I think giving them that self-awareness actually, and, and I've seen that expression on kids' faces where, Oh, this, guy, this guy, he's like my dad, you know, but he's actually listening to me. He's taking notes. He's actually, actually really, he's really listening to what I'm saying. It's like a teacher, you know, and that's when a child quite an unusual experience. Um, someone's really kind of an adult who isn't a parent or isn't a family member, really kind of listening to them and sort of thinking, oh, that's, that's really good. Yeah. You know, um, and I've seen kids kind of like, you know, and also I've seen kids who have been very shy. Uh, we did, I do had some play groups at, um, with some kids at schools and you know, teachers particularly will, you know, there's some kids in the class who won't say anything. You know, you always get the kind of kid who just everything that's just be shouting out. But actually design, playing games with certain people where they actually after a round of, you know, a game, actually the, the one who wasn't saying anything at all at the start is suddenly, you know, the noisiest one in the t on the table. Mm -hmm. And given, and they, uh, we, we used to have this expression, which I still use called the game bubble. Actually, when you're playing a game, you're kind of in this bubble. Um, and what goes on in the bubble, you know, is is the rules of the game. 
you know, and people can behave a different way in the gate, in the bubble. They can sort of take on a role or, and, and kids especially do do that, you know. Um, and actually, people, we all do that without probably consciously realising, especially if it's a, a, a game with a strong story where you take on a character or some kind of role like that. Um, that kind of game bubble is a very interesting model, which is a bit different to computer games, again, because it's a physical bubble. It's like you, you can imagine yourself engrossed in mm. this experience, um, which is, I think, to be honest, face-to-face, right here, right now, is the only real way to do that. You know, mm. I, I don't even... I don't get that from, from you know, VR and stuff in the same way. It's, it's, it's something about the live nature of it, you know. Mm. I, I guess just maybe to flip it, and I think... I don't think I'd disagree with you, even if I'm trying to play devil's advocate, um, about face-to-face interaction. I don't think VR is emulating that but i do wonder whether sometimes it's a bit of an apples and oranges thing of the Mm. what what vr i guess to back up a little bit the i think there's sometimes a mistake if you if you imagine that a camera is supposed to be as perfect as the human eye it never is Mm. yet Mm. if you use the camera's defects and weird quirks like zooming in magnification even things like lens blur where you get rainbows, mm. you, you can do things which actually the eye can't do. And so mm. I feel new technology always deserves that need to be taken on its own merit. So I wonder, I guess my question is, rather than uh, online games trying to emulate in-person experiences in the bubble and the game bubble, mm. what is it that you've started to see that you think, wow, that, that would never be possible in in a physical world and it's actually quite elevating that that's actually quite positive and exciting oh yeah to no, see I, that. I love i love vr it's just, I, yeah, I, you uh, know, I think some of the especially the puzzle some of the puzzle games you can get in vr where they're you know complete as a single player i think completely immersive you know way you couldn't achieve it in any other way you literally are transported to a different place in in a world where physics don't you know, you can just do anything you like, and, and and they are fascinating. I think from a, and I think you, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think like all things, the new technology mim- often mimics that what's gone before it, and sometimes it needs to kind of reinvent its own language, its own style. And I think uh, for sure they can they can in- quite easily inhabit you know the same world and offer something different i guess what I, I guess what i'm saying i think is that i think as human beings you know we have evolved we are who we are you know our, our multi-sensory approach has been we've been like it for you know millennia and and you know I always say to people, you know, it's a classic conversation. Do people still play games, board games? You know, it's like, yes. Because yeah, I, I have a lot of conversation with finances about this because they see the market. They say, well, these board games industry is like going 20%. They don't understand it. It's like, it's like, this doesn't make sense. Who's playing games? And then you kind of tell them that it's, every year there's 3,500 new board games launched and the market's growing at 20%. It's like, wow, wow, wow. And, and then the, the simple answer that I always say is like, you know, we've been playing digital games. We've been playing board games for, as I said, at least 6,000 years. And we've been playing digital games for about 50 years absolute max if you go back to the very first consoles yeah so it's still a t- it's still such a new industry um and and yeah where those kind of you know there's a lot of interesting ideas on the table now with you know you've got digital board games obviously you know the perfect product for me of course would be to marry those two where you've got a kind of you know whether it's a hologram star wars style game screen you know where you've got all of that anything goes scenario but you've got people physically kind of sharing that experience. It, it, like if you're at the cinema, you know, it's the, it's the same thing. You know, if you're watching at home or you're watching in a cinema, there's something about the buzz and the pulse of being with other people physically that's very, yeah. very hard to do digitally. And maybe why try? You know, don't try to copy it because it's, I don't think if you ever will, really, in the, in the foreseeable future, just do your own thing. As you said, you know, find your own USP. Um, mm. and, I, and, I, and it's the same with um, AR, you know, and obviously Lego's doing a pretty good job with AR right now, but AR has been in the toy business for years and years. And I have yet to see, really, 
a, a really good social AR experience because the whole nature of it is you're looking through a screen. Yeah. And so unless everyone's looking through a screen and then, of course, they're just engrossed in the screen. It's like, well, that's no fun. It's it, it, the, the mechanics of how AR work doesn't really suit trying to blend it into a social experience. It's fantastic as a solo experience. You know, you're playing Angry Birds or whatever, or, you know, all those games. Brilliant, brilliant. But as a social experience, nah, I don't really get it. Um, unless you're playing with people remotely, of course. You know, that's a different sort of different thing. But I get so I, I think it's like, it's trying to sort of pick out really what, like in any kind of product, you're, you're always trying to work out what really is its reason, what's rationale, what's its you know, raison d'etre. Otherwise, are we just kind of, does it even need to be here anymore? And you can see from games that, you know, the fact is, I say there's three and a half thousand games, which every year, it's a massive update. People want that social face-to-face connection. They really mm. do. And and that's largely driven by teens and young adults because they're, they're just tired of just, you know, their only communication being digital, you know, they know they're sort of missing something. So you go to most of the games cafes now, which are springing up and continue to spring up around the world, they're, they're rammed. Yeah, they're fully booked, yeah. these places. So there's something in that, you know, uh, there's something in that. But it's it's the best of both worlds, of course. They might, they'll be playing games, or they'll be watching their phones on the how to play video um, to to see how to play it. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of blending those worlds together for sure. And, and and I think it's a it's a very interesting area to continually to explore of how you can mash these worlds together. Well, and I think that's going to be something you know across all consumer products. Mm. Well, well, that's actually a great point that you're making across all consumer products. In that, I I feel what was strange about when I was working at Lego, people were like, "Oh, so you're doing a lot of play and games and bricks?" And you think, "No, I'm actually trying to figure out what is our journey within." our human development why is it that Mm. we you know what what happens in a kid's brain what happens in an adolescence adults da 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 Mm. and 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 obviously you you always you know and i appreciate this is old hat for you but it was still a revelation when you really see how little play in the statistics that adults actually do and Mm. it, it, it it's 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 almost a i haven't quite managed to figure out why we why we let go of something, which we know gives us so much pleasure, which whenever you see, you know, any of these sort of uh, people who write curriculums or whatever and, and, and looking mm. at the economy, they say the creative industry is a sort of incredibly vital. And and so we, we, we put creativity on a pedestal, but then it feels like we, we give it a lot of lip service, but then we mm. don't actually apply it. Mm. And I guess my question is why... Why do you think it's so hard to retain what I guess adults would call lateral thinking, creative problem mm. solving, injecting humour to understand I, nuances? Because yeah. I think, look, I, I don't know about you, Jude, I, I, I definitely was told at school, stop daydreaming. You know, <laughs> don't daydream, don't daydream. So anything that's seen as not factual, you know, and I have to say, you know, I'm not knocking STEM here at all, but a lot of parents interpret STEM as not doing art, not doing music, not doing drama, not doing any creative subject. It's math and science, which is all mm. great. But if you haven't got that underlying um, create, you know, the best, the best people that scientists, mathematicians, politicians, or whatever join, you'll tend to find the best, the people who succeed most are the ones that actually who, who know that, but also creative. Mm. They can marry their innate learning with an imaginative, wow, what if scenario of how to apply that. And, you know, yeah, create, it's a real bugbear for me, um, as it is so, for so, so, take, so taking a run at it, why, why is it, what, what's driving the, the rejection or the lack of incorporating it into business? I'm not saying you've got a, a, a winning answer to this because it's difficult. I think it's the accepting of, um, we used to, um, when we used to ideate product at um, Hasbro, um, the biggest thing for me was that you get people in, like we used to encourage people from all different areas of the business to come in and brainstorm. And for a lot of people, that was probably the the one meeting they really, really didn't want to do. Go on a brainstorm with some designers. It's like, 
they were scared out witless some people you could see they come in like white as a sheet it's the last thing they wanted to do because if you think about it when was that they probably questioning when was the last time in their mind they were Mm. creative you know now of course people are in their everyday lives but in their mind they weren't having that free space i call it kind of wide awake dreaming you know, that, the idea of we're allowed to dream in our sleep, but actually play is all about wide awake dreaming. It's just like you're switching off in the outside world and you just kind of, you're just going with it. And and out of that comes some fascinating stuff because you're sort of, you're just, you're letting your subconscious kind of infiltrate a little bit. You're just letting it, some other interesting things come to play, which, you know, your, your here and now brain just locks out, you know. It's just that you don't get time for that. Um, And it's going to be interesting over this whole experience of lockdown because people are going to have a lot more time to think, you know, and it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it because people are going to be playing more. But I think it's just uh, business is driven by facts, figures, numbers, results, tangibility. And creativeness, as we know, is always always been a tricky one to kind of, well, how long is this going to take? Well, you know, if you're in a concept phase or an innovation phase, we're not entirely sure because we don't <laughs> actually know what it is we're doing. We're just, you know, it, it's like the, you know, and, and always, I always, I've been watching the Imagineer series on Disney Plus and that's, it's, you know, Walt was such a great guy, really, to his whole approach with the Imagineers and, and you know, he's way ahead of his time, so ahead of his time in terms of how he encouraged that kind of thinking. And, and he knew that you're going to have to work on this thing and it might, it will probably fail. You know, and at that time, there really wasn't many people talking about that kind of stuff. So a lot of businesses talk up, you know, failure and, oh, yeah, fail fast. Or this. But they ultimately, it comes down to a process of creativity. So we're going back to the Hasbro thing. We, we changed the room and we set up a place, a kind of play space. And... And I still do it now. I, we developed this technique, or I developed this technique called the play lens, which is, I just do actually name my inventor business after it. But it's about taking people back to their childhood because everybody, I guarantee, <laughs> was a child. And there's one thing I can guarantee. And when you were a six-year-old or a seven-year-old, you were probably, you were a lot more free in your mind, you know? And if you can take people back there, not putting them on a white couch and take, but just kind of say, you know, just think about what did you used to do as a kid? What, what, and actually they start, oh yeah, I used to be really good drawing. I used to love Play-Doh. I used to make models. And and it's sort of like, well, that's great. Well, then you can have a go at this, can't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mm. Uh, because they've had it kind of drilled out of them. If they've if they've left primary school and, and stopped doing any kind of creative subject, which is this kind of self-critique I was talking about, you know, getting it wrong most of the time, trial it out, you know. It's not about Excel sheets and numbers and, you know, factual timelines. It's a lot more woolly than that. And then you go and ask them to manage projects which need all this creativity and manage designers, and a lot of them really struggle. And I think that's where a lot of businesses fail on innovation. It's just they don't really know how to manage the people who are kind of doing the the, the kind of thinking part and the people who are brought in to manage this sometimes are completely out of their comfort zone. Mm. Um, and you saw that, you're going back to Disney, you saw that with the different people who were brought in at Disney at different levels who were like told to run the Imagineers and they really had no idea what they were doing. You know, there wasn't something that was innate for them. And of course, that's when Disney's creativity went right down. The mm. people at Disney hadn't changed, but their manage, the management of them was very different. So I think it's, for companies, it's just about giving... Really, when you when you come at it, it's like what is the what are the things that are going to change your business? It isn't going to come off an else an Excel spreadsheet. And actually, some of the biggest moments of creativity is when people are just left alone. You know, they're not in a brainstorm; they're just left alone to kind of think. You know, in a in a the creative space, they're being allowed to kind of just just spend a couple of hours and or spend a day just. See what, see what, see what, see what happens. There's no agenda. Mm. See what happens, and giving people that kind of creative space just to kind of explore, and you know, it's amazing things happen when you do that. So I, I, it, I think it's necessarily a complicated thing. I think it's just giving people the space and the freedom, and and not kind of measuring them on their output straight away. What did you design? What did you come up with? Uh, I'm not sure if you'd come up with anything, really. I had some ideas, but they weren't, you know. Okay, you know, don't, so I think, and some people will have, the, you know, it's like some people will have 
inspiration very quickly. And, you, and, and it's a muscle, of course. It's a, it's a creative muscle that you can train. And as designers, we do that. We train ourselves to kind of very quickly mm. wheedle out the kind of things that we probably think are going to cause us problems and sort of naturally hone in on the areas we think show a bit of potential. It's just something, after doing it time and time and time and time again, mm. you st- I think you, you cert- well, I do, I know, and I know a lot of people I work with do, and I'm sure you do, Jude, as well. You just, you just sort of naturally warm to certain areas, even if you're not entirely sure. And sometimes that's wrong. You know, you, you go, it's like, oh, actually, I shouldn't have gone there. But more, more you, you build, it's not, it's not just a lucky dip. You build up a kind of a general sense. Um, mm. and, and, and I've noticed that particularly particularly working for myself now, you know, it's something you have to do. Time is, is your time. You have to be very careful how you manage your time. I can't sit around for two weeks and the clients ask me to do something and go, well, I had some ideas, but, you know, yeah, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Here's my invoice. <laughs> You've got, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of, of giving yourself the space to be creative. And, and when you're mm. sort of thinking about budget, you know, forecasting and budgeting a product, for sure, you've got to sort of think, you're not just going to go straight into this and pull it out the drawer, um, but very quickly sort of just figuring out those ideas. And again, that's just a creative muscle. Do, do, you, do you think there's also something to do with, um, I don't know what the word is, but but essentially how creatives like to sort of project themselves? I, I feel that there's almost a sort of... Uh, something that sort of bites creatives in the behind, should we say, of that on the one hand, you want to appear magical and somehow sort of transcending all processes and that mm. there is no spreadsheet. It just, the magic happens in me and that's why I'm I'm the rock star. And yet, actually, whenever you usually speak to sort of good professional creatives, they usually actually have quite a lot of method and structure. Oh, yeah. E- no, even, if, yeah. even if it's, I mean, Thomas Heatherwick has a great phrase of purposeful aimlessness. Now, that doesn't define his entire journey, but he, he allows himself, whatever it is, 5%, 10%, to go, I'm just going to let ideas and stimulus wash over me yeah, without a absolutely. hard agenda. But then... Yeah. And I think the trouble is, this is the trouble with sound bites. Is people could easily say, "Well, gosh, isn't he isn't he dreamy with his big curly hair?" And <laughs> and you think, "Well, actually, yeah." But then, as soon as you've been to the studio, and I have, you see extremely rigorous, iterative honing of like one variable. Mm. Is that mm. the right, you know, lift shaft? Is that the right, you know, uh, atrium? And it's it's gone to infinitesimal detail. Um, and and so I actually, you know, having had the pleasure of working in a, as as a scientist, as well as a designer, I actually look at a lot of creatives and go, you just don't market yourself as having, you know, an aim, a hypothesis, uh, a, a process that that works as what is called the scientific mm-hmm. method. Mm-hmm. And I wonder sometimes, is it that we 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 suffer from this thing that as soon as anybody makes it to the dizzying heights of being a sort of uber creative. They're almost reticent to go. It's quite methodical, and there's bits where you just got to be really critical with your ideas. And well, I, it's so good. You were, I... you were say... <laughs> no, you, you were saying, "Oh, could you share some stuff that you're working on?" I said, "Well, if you want to see some Excel <laughs> spreadsheets, I can share those." Because as that's what I saw with Excel spreadsheets, as game design, yeah. you know, th- th- those things form a big part of what you're doing. You know, once you get into the nitty gritty of it, one thing I do which really helps me is just. I always try and um, draw something very, very basic. If I have just an idea, just a micro idea, just literally sketch that. Because for me, it, it, I help, it one helps me remember it, but just kind of makes it tangible. And it might be literally the crudest of sketches, but then you've got a collection of those and they really help. They really help me. I just can go back and revisit and go, what the hell was I doing there? What was that all about? Um, because it's so easy, these ideas, to get lost. Um, and obviously these days it's so easy to capture them and put them in the cloud and, you know, there's no excuse really. Um, I wish I'd had, <laughs> I wish I'd had this because I was very lazy when I was younger. I, 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 I was very bad with notebooks. I was, I wasn't very kind of methodical with notebooks. I'd, I'd have notebooks, but they'd be all over the place. And, and now I can, the technology has helped me kind of contain that a little bit more. So I think I definitely do that. But yes, the, 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 the approach, this kind of SWOT analysis, you know, I do, once you get past that, once you get into that, you know, I was just saying that warm fuzziness of, 
oh, that sort of thing. So you, you start to go into sort of SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and start really drilling in. And this is, is this an idea? That how, how long is it going to take me to develop? What's the cost it's going to take me to develop? How many companies can I think might be interested in this idea? And then suddenly, no, it's, it's not, it doesn't feel good, you know. And then another idea, which you didn't think was necessarily burning too bright, actually starts to make more sense, you know, mm. for the effort you're going to put in. Because ultimately it is, you know, it, it comes down to man hours a lot of the time. How many, you know, whether that's you as an individual or a company, how many hours are you willing to spend on, mm. this, on this idea? Does it, does it feel like it's going to bear fruit? Um, and if it's a purely an R&D thing and you can, you know... <laughs> Money, no object. There's not many companies like that. Not many companies. <laughs> so uh, absolutely that sort of methodical approach. You've got that kind of warm, fuzzy, upfront bit where it's really hard to... You, I say it's just giving yourself that space and the right stimulus, you know, and, and you know, and knowing what are your trigger points. Might be reading a book, might be going for a walk, might be doing some exercise. It's different people have trigger points where they sort of naturally feel a little... They seem to have better ideas, you know. And there's mm. no scientific proof, you know, sort of logic to it. It's just... Different things sort of, you know, excite people more than others. So I think find your kind of trigger points. Um, and then once you've got these kind of warm, fuzzy sketches or notes or whatever, really start then drilling down into the kind of the detail of them. Um, and yeah, a lot of games design is, you know, particularly is, is, is a bit dull, you know, especially the testing. You know, once you've got the kind of the nuts and bolts of the game, going through the iterations of it, trying it out. Do people get it? No, they don't. What's going wrong with it? And But also the, the thing that I love with games, probably, and it, it's hard, sometimes it happens in consumer products, but it's not, it hasn't in the same way, is that you can have a product and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's like, what is the matter with this product? It really should be a great game. Why doesn't it work? And you just change a rule or a word, or a, especially a rule, suddenly, mm. boom, the whole thing changes from just literally some, some words you've changed in the rule book. And it's it's fascinating and so frustrating at the same time because you're just trying to find, you know, you just don't sometimes, know, again, you, through experience, you can try and see where to look, you know, where to put your magnifying glass. But sometimes it's, there's still games which I've had in the past and I've never really cracked. And I know they are crackable. Absolutely. I just haven't figured out what that is. Um, so it's kind of interesting because it's not a you can't there's no there's no book you can go to there are these game design books but there's no real magic resource you can go to to kind of say how do I fix this and sometimes I do that through collaboration I do a lot of collaboration because that's often the way to unlock these problems is to go and give it to another designer game designer who hasn't seen this thing and they come at it completely fresh none of your baggage and go well you want to do that don't you bosh <laughs> um and, and and I do that with other designers. We you know we it's like yeah. Sometimes you just need a completely fresh approach. Um, you need a different perspective, a different set of thinking. So I I always say you know games design particularly is a team sport. You know it really is. Um, it's most of the successful games if you really look at them, they might have an author on. There's been a lot of people in the background contributing to that. Um, so yeah. I guess um, I, I'm just conscious of time as well, and it, it's been absolutely fascinating talking. And I, I'm so glad we got to talk about uh, not just you know sort of the, the game mechanics, but also just I mean, you've always said to me like routine is incredibly you know significant in your life, and I think it's nice to dispel mm. the myth of just you know this illusion that we're a floating cloud of of no structure and no discipline whatsoever in a creative no, industry. Um, but I guess I thought it might be a nice thing just to, to finish on. And of course, we can avail of any things that come to your mind afterwards and we can put links below the mm. video. But is, is, was I appreciate there's no rule book on how to be a creative, but are there any um, inspirations, you mentioned Walt, that really just sort of changed your entire viewpoint on, on what you do and, and how you create? I think what I would do is, uh, whatever design field you're in, go and explore your adjacent design fields. Um, you might have an interest in them, like professionally to do that, but to see how people are solving the problems they have, whether that's in fashion, whether it's in interior design, architecture, because when you actually scratch the surface, you realise that you've largely got the same kind of problems. It might be framed in a different way. And I found very interesting solutions by 
by talking to those kind of people. Um, mm. So it isn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily books, but actually if you can, you know, go and just have a chat with someone, go, you know, hook them up on LinkedIn and uh, someone who's kind of an adjacent field to you and, and, and see it's a shared experience. Say, so look, you know, I'm interested to share some ideas. You know, I'm not in it. I'm not trying to sell you anything. You, you could listen to me. I can listen to you. And you'll be amazed how many people are really open for that. Mm. Uh, you get a lot out of it. Um, and even people, again, who are completely, that we, there's the whole kind of phrase you probably have heard, you know, kind of the naive expert, where they're an expert in their field, but they have no idea what you do, really, and you have no idea what they do. But they come at it from a, they they look at the problem as, from their professional perspective, and, it, and it's a completely kind of left field approach from how you would look at it. Mm. Um, I remember doing a very interesting project some years ago with... Well, I actually, I, I went on a brainstorm on um, financing a, a, a DIY store's card, like a, a credit scheme. I didn't know anything about credit cards, really, apart from I had one. Um, but I just, I kind of gamified it. You know, I came at it from a game point of view and what would draw people in to use this card. And, and actually, if you look at kind of, you know, Nectar cards and all those kind of stuff, they're very gamified systems, you know, reward schemes and how companies, how finance now works is, is actually quite a gamified approach. So that's obviously that that word has been overused a bit, but um, that's come about by them, you know, at some point, these bankers have got together with somebody who's into game <laughs> theory, you know, yeah. at some point in the past, that's kind of happened. Um, so that's all I would say is, is find your own journey in that respect. Find things that you think are interesting and be very open and don't, and be the, be the naive expert. You know, don't, you don't have to come as cost professional or something. You don't have to be a know-it-all. Um, and I think often you get the best answers when you go and you go, well, I have no idea what you guys do, really. I, I really have no skills in this area. <laughs> These are my skills. Um, let's see if we could create some magic together. Mm. Um, and I think as a designer, you know, I think it's the, the one thing, particularly in our field, in, in play, you're often really are start with a blank sheet of paper. It's There is product iteration, of course. Mm. Um, but there's also a lot of kind of, well, could be anything. Here's a price point. Here's a, here's a kind of play insight. What could we create? You know, and that's really an exciting place to be. And sometimes you, you're not always going to know about those areas. Like if I was doing outdoor toys, I don't know a lot about climbing frames or that kind of play. You know, it's a very structural thing. You'd have to find out about it. But that's an exciting thing to go in and go, you know, with a very open mind. Um, you're bringing the skills you have, but but accept your weaknesses, you know, and, 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 and then you can learn something new. And that's great. Well, I think I think that's a that's a hell of a place to end. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, and I think just really energizing for not just you know students where I know I started to frame this, but I think anyone in their career. I think you're right. Surely it's a good signal to strike up a conversation in a company and an individual who's willing to spar on something in that. So I think it's mm. a, I think within that is actually a lot of unboxing to do of 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 that conversation mm. even occurring. So. Um, mm. Yeah, we'll well, I, say, I always come back. I always always come back. You know, we never had these tools when we started out. I certainly didn't. You know, LinkedIn, mm. it's it's there to be hot. You know, just go and talk to people for crying out loud. It's, there's no excuse. There's no excuse for it. And the tools we have now are incredible. You just mm. got to kind of go out and use them. Yeah. So yeah, but it's been great there talking to you. And uh, <laughs> all right. No, likewise. It was a it was a real pleasure. And uh, thank you so much as always, Richards. And, Good. Uh, Take care, man. Take care. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye.